Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to this session, um, which I think of as a presentation on the robotics project. My colleagues think it's about collecting complex multimodal materials. You can figure out who's right at the end. I'm Keith Webster, Dean of Libraries at Carnegie Mellon. My colleagues, Brian Matthews and Kate Barbera, you will hear from shortly. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for supporting this work, along with contributions from corporate and private donors. Uh, I couldn't, you know, my, my colleagues knew I couldn't resist talking about the World Cup at some point, so these are some soccer robots, quite seriously. Um, I'm just glad we're not up against the Argentina-Croatia game because I would not have been here. Uh, these robots, quite seriously, were developed by faculty in our Robotics Institute with the aim of figuring out whether robots ever could beat humans at soccer. They thought they were onto a good thing because they built a training data set looking at the moves of the Scottish national team, um, and then they tried them against real players, and it all went badly from there. Uh, enough of the, the soccer stuff. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is an institution with an early and rich history of artificial intelligence and robotics, and many of the technologies common today were first developed on our campus, things like self-driving cars, speech recognition, Internet of Things, facial recognition software, artificial intelligence and art, machine learning and library, special collections. And our Robotics Institute was founded in 1979 with the dream of ushering in a new age of thinking robots. And since then, the university has experienced many successes in intelligent manufacturing, space-related robots, um, sending robots into nuclear accidents in this country and in the former Soviet Union. And we also have a separate National Robotics Engineering Center which develops and matures the research from the Robotics Institute into a more conceptual and commercializable approach. And the next in that trinity of large-scale robotics um, facilities will be our new Robotics Innovation Center, which will begin construction on a brownfield site next year with a focus on translational research. So where does the library fit into this sort of thing? Um, many of you have heard me talk before about the inside out, outside in approach to libraries that is shaping our work. And the way I would characterize that briefly is that as our contemporary collections become almost universally digital in arrival and fairly homogenous across um, a network of libraries, our focus on being an outside in library, that is one that was established to bring scholarly content from outside our campus in the form of books and journals is really a process, and don't tell my colleagues this, guys, but it's really something that operates on autopilot. And that shift in effort has allowed us to allocate resources more fully to becoming an inside-out library. That is one in which our efforts are devoted to capturing, curating, and sharing the products of CMU's research with the outside world. And that's in line with the university's strategic plan, which calls on us to curate the evolving scholarly record and use it in ways that have an impact on the world. Like many, we've enjoyed the opportunities and technical challenges associated with preserving data code and publications to support that ambition and to drive the impact of our scholarship and promote scientific reproducibility. As a side note, I, I was thinking when I was in Salva's presentation yesterday about the machine learning reproducibility crisis that we're not talking much about. And the crisis, to an extent, in AI, where we see less than a third of research being verifiable and only one in 20 researchers sharing their code. And that, I, th I think, is a looming topic that we really do need to unpick against the backdrop of reproducibility work. But what about the tangible products of research beyond publications, data, and code? Our colleagues in the fine arts, where they are concerned with paintings and sculptures and costumes and compositions, have done tremendous work. And the GLAM community has really advanced our thinking and our practice around curation of tangible artistic outputs. 
But we really haven't begun really to scratch the surface of how we think about the tangible outputs of artificial intelligence work. You know, Said is leading our open source programs office and is focused on how we capture and make the most of code. But what about things like a robot, which is inherently a tangible object powered by AI? And robotics really serves for us as a very fruitful study in how we think about curation of the fourth industrial revolution. Because what we don't want is for our robots to rust in peace. Thank you, thank you. Sometimes I worry if the accent is going to mangle these things. Uh, and we've been very fortunate to partner with our School of Computer Science, where our Robotics Institute is located, to raise awareness of the issues around curating robots and associated artifacts amongst our research community, both on campus and in the growing Pittsburgh robotics community. We've become a university fundraising priority and we are very pleased with the work that has been completed in the first phase of our research and with that, I'm going to hand over to Brian, who's going to give you the philosophical bit of the lecture, and then Kate will tell you what's really happening. So, Brian, over to you. Thank you. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, Keith talked a lot about CMU, but I wanted to kind of take a step back for a minute and talk about the cultural ethos of robots in Pittsburgh. Uh, I took two pictures on my way to CNI in our airport, and this is one that's like a bridge that transforms into a robot. Um, it's kind of a, a, an interesting interesting 20-foot sculpture that's in the Southwest airline arrival area. But this one was even even more interesting to me. This is kind of a subtle one where it's, uh, this is in Concourse A, if you ever find your way there. There's this like art installation. Have you seen this, Kate? Yeah, <laughs> that's this like uh, retro futurist is what they kind of call it, but it's this robot repair shop where you will bring your robot in and get it anyway. It's really, it, robots is really, um, just everywhere in, in, in Pittsburgh. And when we started this, we kind of asked this question, and I don't know that we've ever actually answered it. It's still an ongoing kind of thing, but it's this philosophical question of what is a robot? And, you know, if we're thinking about archiving or building collections or <laughs> just curating them in general, it's kind of like what we, we need to have a common understanding amongst ourselves. And it's interesting when we talk to the practitioners of robotics because we saw this very early on that there's some that lean really heavily more into the engineering side and there's others that lean more into the computational side, the programming side, and there's, there's nuances between there and the differences between there and different priorities or emphasis. And, and so that's kind of a question that we're still kind of working on, but we've kind of took a step back from that and really tried to look at robotics as a scientific endeavor, as a scientific enterprise and you know we see it as this 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 widespread significant historic intertwined with the human experience you can kind of see it's in manufacturing and transportation medicine healthcare agriculture and mining exploration environmental cleanups and uh, um, <laughs> uh, you know other other uh, other ways as well so I think what we kind of feel is a like a responsibility and a drive to document the, the technical, the social, the, the, the cultural history of, of robotics given this, this prevalence, particularly at our university. And so when we think about that, you know, if we think about it as a scientific enterprise, a scientific endeavor, a mode of inquiry, like we can, we can map that to our current models in terms of workflows and processes and we have tons of models, all tons of models. And, you know, we can understand life cycle, data life cycles and grant life cycles and research life cycles, you know, all of that. And, and think about stewardship practices with that. But here's the thing is we, we kind of dug into it more. The thing that was maybe the most important thing was really the social infrastructure, the human interaction, the engagement between all these kind of individuals. I know it's kind of hard to read, but you kind of have the, these different sort of um, people that are part of labs and part of projects and understanding the role between them is really what we needed to unlock to really understand sort of robotics. And, you know, I think what we felt is to, to really put all the pieces together of this, it's, it's, it's the human element is important. So again, this might be a little bit hard to read and this is not exhaustive, but it's pretty um, close <laughs> of the types of items that we encountered in, in with talking with people, the type of information artifacts and, and objects. So 
I mean, you have physical things like machines and tools and, and uh, casings to take soccer robots to uh, tournaments and things like that. You gotta transport them and things like that. You know, there's research, there's the code, there's the data, there's more hours of video than you would imagine. Um, there's photos, there's all kinds of you know, websites and just dynamic content. Financial documents too, shout out to Meredith <laughs> on that one. Um, and, and so what we kind of arrived at is, is many questions, but I think these are the two that really resonated for me that kept coming back is like, what's important and how is it all connected? You know, and we found ultimately that there's this vast amount of like diverse and dynamic and fragile uh, information and we can't keep all of it. We can't take all of it, you know? <laughs> so it's kind of like, what do we take? And again, I think what we see again is we, you have a, a robot, you have the code, you have all this stuff. What's that connective tissue that brings it all together? That's kind of a, the, the, the thinking that we kind of had. And we came up, we started using sort of this term uh, to, to, to give us a sense of it, which is the sort of multimodal collections. You know, it's this sort of interconnected ecosystem or this network of all those like tangible and intangible uh, types of information, the, the objects, the artifacts, the, the, the narratives as well that really comprise that, that scientific process. And I think, you know, it, in my notes what I kind of wrote down is like, you know, a, a, a big key thing of that was understanding, once we really started to appreciate and understand robotics as an interdisciplinary um, practice, what we realized is we needed to bring an interdisciplinary approach to that. And that it was, it kind of stretched beyond what our university archives could kind of do. And in that matter, it was beyond what a SCALCOM or what a data group could do or any of these individual groups. It's really the sort of bringing it together. And so uh, we kind of had to form our own ecosystem for this project. And uh, it's helpful being able to bring a lot of this talent, a lot of the skills and tool sets that we had within our library that we could bring in for conversations or work with us on different parts and pieces of it. And also we had, um, thankfully Sloan was able to invest um, their interest as well and their money as well <laughs> in helping us to, to round out some things that, that we were missing. But really being able to have that, that ecosystem to understand an ecosystem, I guess, is kind of where we're at. And I'll, just to give you a sense of some of the things we would talk about, it's like, I go out on high concepts a lot of times, but this like stratigraphy was an interesting thing that, that really stuck with us because I think we connected this with like version control a little bit. When, when you think about like a robot and you have, you know, version one, version five, version 50, you know, all these different things, it, it's kind of interesting because each of those versions are kind of developed by slightly different teams or totally different teams. There's different tech components they're using, different computer code that they're kind of using. You know, there is assortment of methods and processes, but while they're unique, there's a through line through it. There's a, there's a, a lineage, there's a trajectory. You know, these are the kind of layering and stacking, like year after year, grant after grant, team after team, that you can kind of document and you can kind of understand. And, and that, was, that was just an interesting concept from a, 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 a geological <laughs> perspective. This is one where, um, it's the operating chain. I'll let Kate do the French pronunciation for that. And um, I am cheering for France. I've been cheering for France since the beginning, much to Keith's uh, <laughs> displeasure. But uh, <laughs> here we go. But um, but I do like the I like Morocco, Croatia. Final. That would be interesting. Um, it's a very international campus. We have a lot of uh, football comes up. But anyway, the operating chain was really really. Um, this one really stuck with me, I think stuck with Kate too. You know, this was a, an interesting concept that comes from anthropology and archeology, span and it's, it, it gave us some sort of framework for conversations around looking at technological development or processes combined with social acts. I'll just read this off because I think it's really good. It's like um, the operating chain enables one to better understand not only the society in which a technique originated, but also the social context, the actions, the cognition that accompanied the production of an object. This one they're looking at wheat, um, you know, <laughs> wheat production. But we were kind of applying that again to that concept. Let me go back here. Again, you have all these different parts and pieces happening. A lot of things is kind of nonlinear. There's not just one grant and it's done. There's 20 grants happening at once and postdocs doing different things and dissertations being written and it's very 
it's a messy, <laughs> messy enterprise. So again, being able to think about that, that how is the, how are things being developed over time and how are they all connected was really, um, really interesting to us. And so moving it on, um, you know, I think we feel, we feel a sense of urgency because there's a lot of the foundational leaders and practitioners in robotics at our university are, are retiring or have retired and, you know, there's a, an urgency we feel to really get those stories and get those materials and we've kind of, we have an um, exhibit that kind of talks about some of the, the, the work that this project has been working on that covers that and this is the one slide I grabbed from it. But it, it, you know, the, the obsolescence is not thing new to this group, but it's something that we feel is even, um, I don't wanna say exaggerated or, or heightened in sort of even early career researchers today because of the type of environment, the type of projects, everything's kind of cloud-based, there's a lot of reuse or, or, or uh, deletion, you know, things that kind of happen where we can't wait 20 or 30 or 40 years for someone to donate their materials for us because it's gonna be gone, you know, and we keep getting at this idea of how can we get access quicker, how can we get snapshots and, and more iteratively to projects that are kind of happening in, in sort of robotics and beyond robotics really to really do this type of work. So I'll end my kind of piece here before handing over to Kate around, this was kind of like a unofficial motto, maybe it was a battle cry, it was a, a grand challenge that we faced of, of how do we preserve things that were not intended to be preserved, you know, and that's just kind of, um, it, it's been a fun place to, to, to operate in. So, all right, Kate. Yeah. Hopefully I can get both computers up here without knocking the entire podium down. <laughs> all right, let's see. Well, I'm Kate Barbera, I'm an archivist and oral historian at Carnegie Mellon University, and I am also lead archivist for the Robotics Project. Um, so I also wanna add my thanks to the Sloan Foundation for funding this research um, and letting us explore some of these really fascinating challenges. Robotics is a, a wonderful case study for archives. So you've heard about the background of this project and some of our thinking about our approach. Well, now I'm gonna give you the archivist perspective. So I'm gonna talk about our activities and our research over the past couple of years since 2020. Um, and I also included on the slide here just a summary of our vision. So our vision is really to document the development of robotics and educate and inspire future generations. So what that means is we're not just interested in products, we're interested in process. We're also focused on long-term preservation. So thinking about robotics in longer time scales. So 10 years, 20 years, 30 years beyond, are we going to have access to materials from this crucial moment in history from this field that is really transforming our society and our world? So as Brian mentioned, the field produces a large volume of complex material. This is artifacts, archival material, documentation, software code, video photographs, and many other types of material. Uh, this is made even more complicated by the vast teams that undertake robotics research. Um, it's a highly collaborative field, and what this means from a practical point of view, so for myself as an archivist, is that these materials are often geographically distributed. So not just within our region, but across the country and across the globe. So that in and of itself is, is, a, is a difficult challenge we're facing. So the image on the slide is a common visual understanding of robotics. So you imagine these discrete items that were designed to accomplish specific tasks. But what we found is that robotics actually looks something more like this. <laughs> and you can imagine the look on our processing archivist's face when she saw one of the lab storerooms for the first time. It's very rarely discrete items. They're interconnected, they're complex, they're messy, they're created by many different people um, who are part of these transient communities. So you have students, postdocs, researchers coming in and out of these labs, creating a very dynamic and, as you can see, messy environment. 
Um, and so this is really the, process, the problem that we're facing. And we could have attacked this from several different perspectives, right? We could have looked at it from an archivist perspective. We could have looked at this challenge from a data management perspective. We could have looked at this challenge from a digital preservation perspective, software preservation. Pick your discipline. But what we chose to do is actually to take a step back and think about what are the fundamental questions that we need to answer in order to even figure out how to get started. Um, and Brian already touched on some of these. So the first one is, how do we define robotics? And if you ask a roboticist, he mentioned this before, even they don't really know. You ask the question, what is, robot, what is a robot? You will get a different answer from every person you talk to. So defining our scope is one of our challenges. The other question is something that you know, archivists think about all the time, is what is most valuable? So thinking about what has long-term value, what is important to preserve over the long term, and who is making that decision? So who are we preserving it for? Is it for archivists, is it for historians, or is it the community of researchers that we're working with? And so unpacking these questions really became the focus of the first phase of this project. And we decided to focus our efforts essentially on data collection. Right? We don't have all the answers, let's go out and find them. So one of the strategies that we used was community engagement, and we built this in from day one of this project. We really tried to center um, community engagement to build meaningful connections with roboticists and with the robotics community. So this means treating it as a true partnership. This means working with the Robotics Institute, with SCS and the robotics community in order to do everything from market and design the project to do site visits, to think about how we're talking about the work that we're doing. We also wanted to ground it in the cultural context of our organization. So thinking about what makes robotics at Carnegie Mellon unique but how does it also apply to the broader, the broader robotics environment? So what, what concepts and ideas can we observe in our own context, but then apply that out to the broader robotics field? We also looked at pre-custodial field work. So thinking about how do we collect as much context and data as possible about the material before they come into our care. So for us, this meant designing a pre-custodial fieldwork approach that would allow us to gather this context. So this involves site visits, it involves observation, it involves a lot of ethnographic methods that are sometimes utilized by archivists and information professionals, but not always. But in this case, we found it absolutely crucial to begin thinking about how do we gather as much context as possible. And this data informs our collection development strategies. So what are we collecting? How are we collecting it and why? But also thinking about appraisal. What value are we placing on these materials? Preservation, so thinking about digital preservation strategies as well as physical. Conservation, so these are often physical objects we're dealing with and gathering as much information about the context of creation can sometimes inform the care and maintenance over time. As well as our public programming, so what does our messaging look like about these materials? It also informs metadata and discovery. So, this data collection uh, approach really began to be the heart of what was going to allow us to tackle these, these really complex issues. We also looked at prototyping. So how do we apply what we're learning from the pre-custodial field work that we're doing to small, somewhat manageable collections? <laughs> <laughs> and we began to think about you know, future access and discovery modalities. So how are we going to be serving these materials up and to who? And who will find use in them? Um, if you talk to a roboticist about what they see, what value they see in historical materials, often you'll get the answer, they don't see any value in it. But what underlies that, that answer is a, just a difference in how we assign value and how we talk about that value. So it's not that they're, they don't find it useful to have this historical documentation and artifacts available. It's that the way we even talk about that is just different. So understanding 
you know, through these prototypes, how we might be able to collect and preserve this material in a way that makes sense for the community became really important. We also, as I mentioned, began to look at different access and discovery strategies. So what we're interested in doing long term, and, and Brian talked about this a little bit, is how do we present the archival collections, the material, the artifacts, in a way that exposes this really fascinating interconnected ecosystem that makes up robotics. Um, one answer for us was to do this using digital collections, so serving up the archival material and really letting it speak for itself. Um, so in next year, we're gonna be premiering um, a new Islandora digital repository, uh, which is modeled after our digital collection site, and actually one of our colleagues is right next door talking about that right now. <laughs> um, that will premiere to the public next year. Um, and what this system really allowed us to do was to take advantage of those linked data capabilities that the new version of Islandora has and begin to build out these relationships between projects, between teams, between this ecosystem, and try to expose that through the digital collections. We're also exploring network visualizations. So on the slide, you can see an example of a project that one of our graduate students did um, this past year, um, looking at some of the data in the Robotics Institute annual research reviews and starting to play with that, starting to look at how um, we can visualize the interconnected community um, behind robotics research. And you can see that there are a few folks who are you know, really central nodes to just about everything that happened in the Robotics Institute during the decade that she looked at. Takeo Kanade, one of the founders of Computer Vision, being one of them, right, a central node in many, many different projects. So we have a couple of key takeaways from this process. Um, and I share them here. Um, because they speak to some of the ideas and concepts and challenges that I've been hearing from a lot of the presentations during this conference over the past day or so. Is, um, for us, one of the early challenges was overcoming these persistent communication islands. So what I mean by communication island is we tend to live in silos when it comes to how we talk about and how we think about um, the value of long-term preservation. Um, and so for us, it became key to try to figure out um, how to overcome that. So for us, we began to think about, even fundamentally, how are we talking about archives and documentation? Documentation became an interesting term that we had to unpack with the community as we were working with them. For us, for archivists and librarians, documentation means one thing. To the robotics community, it means something very different. And so being mindful of how we're using this terminology and coming up with a shared language became a kind of a side quest <laughs> of this project. Um, it takes time to build trust and understanding. And this is a skill set that I work on as an oral historian, but I've also found applications to this project as well. Um, and I would stress, don't rush that, pro that process. You know, fundamental to this project has been uh, community engagement from the beginning. Part of the reason is we need to overcome this issue of communication islands, is how are we talking about and thinking about these materials? Coming up with a shared language, coming up with a shared concept, idea, and, and goal, um, and pursuing that in partnership um, with the community. So another uh, takeaway that I think might be interesting for this group is that for robotics, a holistic collecting strategy is preferred given the prevalence of hybrid and dependent artifacts and documentation. So by that I mean robotics material is often best viewed and understood either in situ or in context. So for example, um, there's a robot in our collection called the Trojan Cockroach, and I, I don't have a, an image of it here, but it's a fascinating machine. I recommend you look it up. 
um, but it was a six-legged, massive robot designed in about 1983 by Ivan Sutherland, who is best known as the founder of computer graphics. But apparently in 1983, he was playing with robots at Carnegie Mellon. Who knew? Um, <laughs> But he, he created the, the, the Trojan cockroach and it was the first robot capable of carrying a human. What we have left of this machine today is some dispersed documentation, some plans that he created, and a few parts and pieces, and that is it, an occasional video or photograph. But you take any one of those, those items and look at it in isolation, and it doesn't give you an understanding of what that robot actually did. If you look at the parts and pieces, the pistons and, and other components that we have left, it doesn't give you a sense of how it moved. It doesn't give you a sense of how it functioned. If you look at the video, it doesn't give you a sense of the size and the scale. And so in talking with the robotics community, one of the key takeaways for us is that we need to rethink how we're collecting this material. Archives, we often focus on interstitial material. All of that, the, the documentation, the items, the photographs, videos, and, and other material outside of the physical artifacts. But with this, this field, we can't necessarily take that approach. And so part of our collecting strategy needs to be breaking down these silos between the published content that usually ends up in libraries, the artifacts that usually end up in museums, and all of the, you know, the catch-all of everything else that tends to end up in archives. Begin to think about how we can approach it more holistically. So the, the final um, takeaway uh, for this group is that archival and long-term preservation work are hindered by the lab environment. So uh, this means, you know, these transient communities, these students, these postdocs that are constantly coming in and out and taking information and knowledge with them. Um, but there's also a lack of incentives for, for lab members to begin to think about personal responsibility when it comes to building their own archives and maintaining them over the time. So these sustainability factors hinder and sometimes block long-term preservation efforts. And so how do we think about this issue, not just from an archives perspective, but incorporating a lot of the skill sets that are in this room, data management, software preservation, how do we combine those into a model that we can begin to apply to this, this complex field? So, it's not just about you know, the issues that this lab environment causes today in terms of you know, reproducibility of data. It's also causing issues for you know, collections that we'll need to access in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You know, the, the question becomes, in this uh, really vital moment in robotics history, which we're living right now, what material do we want to be able to access in the future? You know, what do we want to be able to pass on to the next generation? Um, and what will students and researchers want to be able to access and understand about some of the technology that is being developed right now? So early next year, we're gonna be premiering um, what we're calling Multimodal Archives, a toolkit for collecting robotics and other material in a research ecosystem. So it's basically a summary of the lessons learned, of the strategies that we tried, um, and a set of recommendations for archivists and information professionals who are interested in this, in this work. Um, our hope is to begin to develop a community of practice for archivists and, and others concerned with this idea of long-term preservation, not just for robotics, but for fields similarly defined by these multimodal materials, but also these complex collaborative processes that add a, an extra layer of challenge. So this could be artificial intelligence, computer science design, architecture. Um, like I said, our goal is really to cultivate this community of practice so that collectively we can begin to think about how we wanna approach these issues. So we are right on time. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Our contact information is on the slide, and we really appreciate, yeah, your presence here today. Thank you so much.
Hello. Uh, firstly, may I just congratulate you on fantastic presentation and, and really looking forward to the report as well. Also, fully rooting for Morocco, Croatia final as well. So really on that, sorry, Keith. Um, I just wanted to, this is not a question, but a connecting aspect. So there are a couple of projects in the UK which are looking at not robotics, but the process of design and how to ar capture that from an archival perspective. And I thought I'll connect that just in case if there are links that might be helpful. One of them is called PR Voices, which is practice research voices and how to incorporate the context and the repository infrastructures and everything else that's needed. And they're looking at, like you were talking about Arlindora, they're looking at a particular repository infrastructure called Haplo to see whether um, context can be incorporated and practice-based or practice-led research can be incorporated in repository infrastructures. And the other one is called Sparkle. I came with that acronym. It's a University of Leeds project. I, people hate me for that acronym, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, Sparkle stands for Sustaining Practice Research for, uh, sorry, Sustaining Practice Assets for Research, Knowledge, Learning, and Engagement. And that's very much looking at the, um, the context and the social context and the practice context and how to capture that effectively while a design process is going on. So we were particularly focusing on School of Fine Art and School of Design, but I can almost see very, very similar things you're talking about in your robotics aspects that link very strongly with that. So I think this is just a comment about um, there are lots of similarities in what happens in design, even in nursing, in any kind of medical profession where practice is involved with this, so I'm really looking forward to that, and thank you. Thanks, Masood. <clears throat> John. I think my question comment is about audience in a couple of ways. I believe it was Keith uh, early on said something about this project, uh, one of the goals would be to inspire students and others coming to the university to see the, uh, the kind of unique uh, program and the history of the program. And that really got my attention and interest. And so I kept thinking as you went through the different presentations, why wasn't exhibits, museum kind of um, framework uh, being talked about a little bit more? Because there, there are two things that I think of. One is for students, seeing it is going to be a lot more important than just knowing you've got an archive. And I don't mean just some small exhibit of one screen or you know something in one exhibit case, but something that's on a really fairly large scale, that would be inspirational, I think. And the, the second thing in terms of audience was you talked a lot about consulting with the people building the road, all the members of the team and things about, and I was struck by at least one of them saying, ah, we don't really care about the history. But the people who would care about the history are historians of technology, historians of science. And I just, I'm assuming you interviewed some of those people as well in terms of what uh, they wanted to see in terms of the record. So again, I, there are co more comments, but I would uh, welcome your views on those. Thank you. Sure. I'll just say real quick, we have grand visions. <laughs> we just we were talking more about the data modeling and the mm -hmm. concepts there, but I'll, Kate will go there. Is that working? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the the idea of a museum comes up quite a lot, and um, while we were really interested in this idea, and and it's likely something that we'll continue to pursue and investigate. One of the challenges of, of approaching it solely from this kind of museum exhibition perspective is um, restoration is really difficult and really expensive. Um, and the organizations that do it well to pick and choose which objects they're going to restore. Um, and so when you're talking about you know, the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon it has 40 plus years of history, has been prolific as, as it has been. How do you decide which robots you're going to restore? But then also, how do you ensure that you have the expertise, the skill set, and the, inten the attention of the community um, that is able to maintain that item? 
in order to keep that exhibition going. And so that, that's a question that we're grappling with is, um, is restoration really one of our priorities or is there another way we can provide the same level of inspiration and engagement through other means, whether it's through a digital collection experience, through, through VR or augmented reality experiences. So there are, there's a whole constellation of options that, that could be in the future um, for this project. But yeah, you're not the only one to, to bring up this idea of a museum and it is something that yeah, we're continuing to investigate. So we, we did have a, a small but very interesting exhibition in our main university library last year, and there are artifacts from that on the website, including various animations. But <clears throat> Kate hit on many of the points. I mentioned in my remarks that the university is building this robotics innovation center, and there is an expectation that we will be creating exhibitions there. One of the challenges that Kate alluded to is that many of the robots, things that were designed to go to Mars or the moon or whatever, are big. <coughs> Um, and storing them anywhere is something that we're wrestling with. And another thing that surfaced through Kate's remarks was robotics research often begins by building a robot and then dismantling it to create the parts for the next robot and so on. Mm -hmm. So we really do have this challenge of restoration and how do you resurrect a dead cockroach? <laughs> uh, it, 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 it is, yeah. It's a great question. We, we do have, a, to your second point, Joan, a, in our special collections team, we have a very strong history of science and technology perspective and a rich community there who have been intimately involved with this project, so they have had a voice. Mm -hmm. We have a historian of technology on, the, on our team currently, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have three minutes if there is a final question, otherwise it sounds like it's a sweepstakes on is it going to be Croatia, Argentina, <laughs> France or Morocco? Um, I can say just a, a couple more words on, about Keith's point um, concerning cannibalization is um, it, it is difficult to um, identify concrete strategies for how to holistically display a robot that no longer exists. Um, and it's a, a constant challenge that we have, as, as Brian had that question on the slide, is how do you preserve something that isn't meant to be preserved? Um, and it's, it's a question that we come back to again and again and again. Um, you know, Using the Trojan cockroach as an example, um, if we had waited to um, take on or preserve that material, likely it would have gone, it would have been lost or further cannibalized. And so as time goes on, um, it becomes more difficult to do this work. So th there's also a sense of urgency around this. So it's not just the question of restoration versus cannibalization. It's also at what moment do you start uh, beginning your preservation work? Yeah. No, please go for it. Just quick one. In terms of uh, intellectual property and patent, did you run into this, and how did you handle it? IP and patents. Yeah. Um, so intellectual property is is definitely one of the conversations that that is ongoing with this project. You can imagine the <laughs> the difficult barriers concerning you know intellectual property rights and preserving this material. Um, one of the things I often say to the team working on this project is we don't have all the answers, but we know where to look. And so um, someone um, was talking earlier about how we can pull inspiration from different fields um, in order to design models for robotics. And we're doing that with intellectual property as well, looking for inspiration you know, in other fields that, that perhaps are a little bit further along. Um, in terms of long-term preservation and um, identifying different yeah. strategies, yeah. So we are right on time, so thank you for being here. Thank you for your questions. Enjoy the rest of the conference.